Okay, so let's get started, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today on Tuesday, May 18th, 2021. My name is Teresa Hollerbach. I'm a research scholar in Department One, and it is my privilege to welcome you to the Institute's Colloquium of the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science. Since I started my PhD here at the Institute, science communication has always played an important role in my work. And so I did not have to think twice when the organizers of the Institute's Colloquium asked me to moderate today's session. In 2017, I was celebrating with fellow PhDs from various disciplines, a science festival at the Museum für Naturkunde in Berlin. Together with the general public, we sat under the huge skeleton of a dinosaur and we listened to inspiring talks about the connection between science and poetry. And we learned also how physics is presented slightly different in Hollywood films. And this was one of the key moments for me in realizing how engaging science communication can be and also how important it is to communicate research to an interdisciplinary audience and also to non-scientists. Other events followed, like the long Night of Sciences in 2018, where I had the chance to um, present my research, science slams, and also um, various workshops that our um, journalists in residence have held. And now the Institute's colloquium on the topic of public communication and trust in science. And this colloquium is actually the last in the serious crises and capacity perspectives in the humanities and social sciences. And I want to use the occasion to express my sincere thanks to the organizers, Stephanie Hood, Lisa Onaga, and Pablo West de Olana, um, who have made a great job in transferring the colloquium to the online space. The series aims to develop deeper and broader understandings about the role of history of science for making sense of COVID-19 and vice versa. Therefore, it has brought together researchers and today also journalists who are looking at different parts of the world within and in relation to the history of science. Without any doubt, the current pandemic has highlighted the importance of science communication, but also its struggles in combating an infodemic in which misinformation was often traveling faster than the virus. Vaccine hesitancy is already an issue in Hong Kong and in the US and will certainly become one in other places too. So today we will do a pulse check and discuss public communication and trust in science in the COVID-19 pandemic um, from multiple perspectives. And we are very honored to be joined by our three panelists, Ishu Mao, Scott Gabriel Knowles, and Laura Spinney to discuss their brilliant work at the forefront of this topic. And I'm sure we will learn a lot from their insights. And um, before I introduce all the speakers at once, we have now some housekeeping notes. We are recording the talks and the panel discussion of the speakers only. So each panelist will speak for around 10 to 15 minutes, followed by a group discussion amongst the speakers. We will then conclude the recorded part um, of the session and invite everyone to turn on their cameras and open up the floor to a Q&A session. And um, you can check out the Etherpad link, um, which um, we will put into the chat box. And um, you can queue up there for questions. And if you um, just, um, uh, yeah, you can just write out your questions anonymously also there um, if you pre prefer to do so. And um, we have also listed in the Etherpad um, useful links, including the link to the intranet virtual back shelf, where you can find publica the publications of the panelists. And um, yeah, we'd like to thank here the library uh, for their support in this. And we also thank Verena Brown and Aaron Richmond and the communications team for their support. Uh, support. So now I'm very pleased to introduce our first speaker, Ishu Mao. 
Yishu Mao is a pre-doctoral fellow in the Lisa Meitner Research Group, China in the Global System of Science here at the Institute. She holds a degree in Global Studies from Humboldt University in Berlin and spent parts of her studies in New Delhi and Buenos Aires. There she conducted research on globalization from the perspective of the Global South. She has worked at the MacArthur Institute for China Studies on a range of topics, including the ideology um, of Chinese overseas studies, digital development, and the intersection of online public opinion and policymaking in China. Her current research focuses on the ethics and values in the development of science and technology in China, especially in the field of artificial intelligence. And on this topic, she has recently published a paper, What's Hyped and What's Real? The State's Innovation Ambitions versus Society's Concerns, Social Media Discussions on Artificial Intelligence and Ethics in China. As part of her work in the Lisa Meitner Research Group, Ishu also works on a study of the complex role of Chinese scientists in the COVID-19 crisis. And this is, of course, especially interesting to our colloquium today. And we are very happy that um, she will give us a more nuanced view um, of public communication and trust in China during the COVID-19 pandemic. And we are also particularly thankful to Yi Shu for having joined the colloquium at the very last minute um, since our original speaker, Chi Fan Yang, had to cancel her um, participation due to unforeseen circumstances. But we hope to um, invite Chi Fan Yang for an institute event at some point in the future. Our second speaker is um, Scott Gabriel Knowles. He's a historian of disaster worldwide. Um, which is also underlined by his recent move from the US to South Korea, where he has taken up a professorship at the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology. So to him, it is more an evening colloquium today. Um, in his work, he focuses on the historical processes that make disasters possible, and he investigates how history can be applied in order to reduce future disasters. In 2019, Scott was a research fellow of the Inter-University Center for the History of Science and Technology at the Nova University of Lisbon. He has previously been a research fellow or a visiting faculty member of the Research Center for Integrated Disaster Risk Management in Chile, here of the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science in 2016, of the Rachel Carlson Center, and of the University of to Tokyo. He has authored and edited many books, and I will point here only to his most recent publication, Legacies of Fukushima 3.11 in Context. And he has edited the volume with Kai Cleveland and Ryoma Shinea, and it comes fresh of the University of Pennsylvania Press. And we also hear that he is currently completing two new books with the promising titles, The United States of Disaster and Slow Disaster. His work on the history of risk and disaster has appeared, amongst other, in the Natural Hazards Observer, Observer, History and Technology, and Journal of Policy History. And he has written for the New York Times and the Washington Post, to name but a few. I could continue now this list for a while, but one of the most interesting things about Scott's work for our discussion today is his, his podcast, COVID Calls. Since March 2020, he has hosted every weekday a live discussion of the COVID-19 pandemic. And as for now, he has talked to more than 400 guests. Um, and among them are researchers from various disciplines, journalists, health practitioners, poets, and even his own family. COVID Calls is a public venue that everyone with an internet connection has access to and can participate in, either as a guest or by commenting and asking questions via YouTube and Twitter. So we are very curious to hear more about this form of public communication, of how questions of trust in science are debated on this platform and about what we can learn from this unique perspective on the pandemic. Thank you so much for joining us. Now I come to our third speaker and journalist in residence, alumna Laura Spinning. She is a writer and science journalist based in Paris. She has published in The Guardian, The Economist, Nature, and National Geographic, among others. She is the author of two novels, The Doctor and The Quick, 
and also of a collection of oral history, Rue Centrale. In 2017, she published her best-selling nonfiction account of the 1918 influenza pandemic, Pale Rider, The Spanish Flu of 1918 and How It Changed the World. And this book has been translated into 16 other languages. And this work has gained increased attention with the outbreak of COVID-19, since um, the almost forgotten influenza pandemic is often used as a comparison to the current pandemic. So she has been interviewed, for example, by Der Spiegel. She was guest by TED Radio Hour or the podcast Today in Focus of The Guardian to give her expertise and to talk about the lessons from the Spanish flu pandemic. In addition to this, she has published many articles on the COVID-19 topic, among them an exclusive interview with um, Christian Drosten, who is yeah, probably, needless to say, one of the leading uh, coronavirus experts in Germany. And other topics were the efforts to um, document the COVID-19 pandemic for future historians or the importance of vaccine equity. So she is the perfect fit to our um, other two panelists, bringing in her perspective as a um, science journalist, so as an expert of communicating science to the public. And we are, of course, very glad to have her here on our colloquium today. This being said, the floor is open to our speakers, and we'll start with the micro lecture of Ishu Mao. So Ishu, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you so much, Teresa, for the introduction about um, our research, small research group uh, within the Liz Meitner group that's looking at the public roles of uh, Chinese scientists during the COVID crisis um, from a sociologic perspective. And uh, I apologize in advance that if you hear some noises from my background, because at the balcony there's construction work and uh, yeah, I can not really stop them. So forgive me for that. Um, so yeah, I'm very happy to share some of the uh, preliminary findings from, from our research group. Um, Chinese scientists have been undertaking numerous indispensable tasks since the day one of the outbreak, and this go beyond the obvious roles in documenting early anomalies, um, sequencing the genome of the novel virus, sharing information with the global scientific community, uh, etc. But what perhaps less known to people outside China is how Chinese scientists engage in public crisis communication and help to establish trust in science as well as governmental decisions. Today, I want to demonstrate this and argue that several individuals have played outstanding parts in this. But first, I want to emphasize the complex set of status that most prominent scientists in China usually possess. Most of the academic and media analysis of China's COVID response, which I read, have treated China, the Chinese government, the Chinese Communist Party, or Chinese officials as rather homogenous and unitary entities, um, disregarding an army of very diverse personnel who contributed to the country's disease control strategies and who put them into practice on the ground. In fact, many of these personnel hold multiple statuses at the same time. Among the government officials, CCP members, and People's Liberation Army's ranks, are virologists, immunologists, epidemiologists, and doctors who provided indispensable information and advice on disease control in China and internationally. Some scientists are also investors, board members, and corporate partners in the pharmaceutical industry whose interests are intricately connected to their research into the treatment of COVID disease. As the virus sweeps through our China and the world, these individuals are playing and made to play various roles, including establishing scientific credibility on different stages. I will give a few examples to illustrate how public trust in science was forged when some individuals smoothly switch between their different roles, adopting diverse techniques, and how trust in science is undermined multiple roles of some individuals created conflicts and raised public controversies. The first individual I want to give is Gao Fu. 
He is a virologist and immunologist trained in Shanxi Agricultural University in China, Oxford, Harvard, and many other prestigious institutions. He is the director of China's Center for Disease Control and Prevention. He is an academician of the Chinese Academy of Sciences, and he also holds seven other international academician titles. In the early days of Wuhan outbreak, he was probably the most talked about person in China, not only because of his position in the most important institution in public health management, but also because of an academic paper he published on New England Journal of Medicine. In the paper, there is a histogram depicting the onset of illness among the first confirmed cases of novel coronavirus infected pneumonia in Wuhan. The earliest cases shown in the graph is on the 7th of December. Because the cases of viral pneumonia in Wuhan were only public announced at the end of December, screenshots of the histogram in Gauss paper were widely disseminated by social media users as evidence of the government's attempts in suppressing information as it did in the SARS outbreak. CDC and Gauss roles were thus widely debated. Some people saw Gauss data as a whistleblow through the communication channels of science, while others criticized Gauss failing his duty that he did not inform the public when his team detected the virus in the beginning of December. The different opinions demonstrated expectation for Gauss' different statuses, and some even pitched the responsibility of his public official status against his scientific, scientist status by accusing him of busy with publishing paper in a foreign journal instead of leading CDC to combat the virus. However, it is notable that, in the, Chinese, that the Chinese CDC is a public institution, Shi Ye Danwei, with the responsibility to provide social service and implement administrative institutions, but not administrative institution itself. It is very different from the CDC in the US, for example, which is an administrative institution. To respond to the criticism, Gao repeatedly emphasized this difference and his lack of authority in making epidemic management policies. He can only report the data and advices to the administrative institution above CDC's level, but he cannot make the decision to inform the public, the first instance when he was sure about imminent epidemic. Basically, he said that what caused the delay in the public announcement about the novel virus is not failure in his monitoring system, but politics. This clarification of the limited jurisdiction of his role as CDC director partially appeased those people who questioned him. But Gao also explained that in the histogram, the onset of illness among the first cases was inferred from the date of the diagnosis. And it does not mean that CDC has detected the spreading of the virus as early as December the 7th. This technically tenable explanation perhaps saved Gao from trouble, which might be caused by him blaming the delay in public announcement about epidemic to his superior institutions and politicians. Controversies around Gao demonstrated very well the subordinated position of science under politics in China, especially the difficulties faced by scientists, public officials in negotiation between the roles. The Chinese public, despite initially questioning Gao's integrity as an epidemiologist, later showed understanding of this, this difficulty and dubbed Gao as the pot-carrying hero, Bei Guoxia. Pot in this context means liability, so Gao was considered as the hero who carried liability in China. Another person who has frequently uh, appeared in media coverage about COVID in China is Zhang Wenhong, an infectious disease doctor and the director and secretary of the party branch of Shanghai Huashan Hospital's Department of Infectious Disease. He gained initial fame in China at the end of January 2020, when he told media that he assigned doctors who were Communist Party members to work at the hospital on the front line of the outbreak in Shanghai. He claimed that party members have all pledged an oath when they joined the CCP, so they should go to the front line either out of belief or because the party's rules. 
his comment won much support on Chinese social media, where many people said that they were fed up with what they saw as rhetoric and empty talk from government over the outbreak. Later on, Zhang gained increasing popularity for his active public dissemination of information and knowledge about the virus and how people can protect themselves. Because there was growing misinformation on Chinese social media, Zhang even set up a social media account himself so he could help people to find scientific and reliable sources of information. His matter of fact style of communication also won the authority support who needed experts to talk to media to give general public confidence. John recorded many science education programs regarding COVID. Unlike Gao Fu, who encountered difficulties in rendering his multiple roles compatible in front of the general public, John smoothly switched between his roles as a CCP member and as a medical expert. He won public trust by showing the public that it is possible to be both read, loyal to the CCP, and scientific, loyal to truth and facts. So in the last example I want to give um, is uh, Zhou Nanshan. He is perhaps the most well-known Chinese pulmonologist uh, during COVID pandemic. He's usually known for being the whistleblower for Chinese government suppression of information during SARS and his leading role in advising China's, uh, China's crisis management in the pandemic. He has been perhaps the most important figure in forging people's trust in science and governmental policies during both crises. However, here I want to highlight some of the recent controversies around his involvement in the pharmaceutical industry. Zhang has, uh, sorry, Zhou Nanshan has always been very keen in proving the efficacy of traditional Chinese medicine used in scientific methods, and he's leading multiple research projects in this regard. In October last year, at a meeting with a very long name, the Guangdong Macau Respiratory Pathogens New Drugs Joint Research Center and uh, Guangzhou Baiyunshan Pharmaceutical Holding Company's board meeting, um, Zhong Nanshan gave a speech claiming that Balangan, a traditional Chinese medicine formula, is effective in killing coronavirus in in vitro research. The speech was recorded, edited, and cut the in vitro research part and uploaded online. As the public got the information that Van Langen is effective in killing coronavirus, the stock price of the um, Van Langen producer company skyrocketed and people started to stockpiling Van Langen products. Although John later made public statement that his speech was used for commercial interest, the effect of John's words on the interests of pharmaceutical industry nevertheless led many social media users to question his integrity as a researcher. On another occasion, John claimed that Lianhua Qingwen, another traditional Chinese medicine formula, is effective in treating COVID pneumonia. However, John is very close to Wei Yiling, the founder of main Lianhua Qingwen producer in China, Yiling Pharmaceutical. Both Zhong and Wu are academicians at the Chinese Academy of Engineering, and in July 2019, they established the Nanshan Yiling Research Center at Guangzhou Medical University. Chinese social media users pointed out that through this collaborating format, Yiling, uh, Wu Yiling could have financially supported Zhong Nanshan's research, and they could benefit each other financially. Similarly, John recommended Xue Bizing, a traditional Chinese medicine injection, which was approved by the Chinese State Drug Administration for the treatment of severe COVID pneumonia in April 2020. John Nanshan is the board member of the pharmaceutical company and uh, that produced this injection, Hong Rei Pharmaceutical. Although John's role in the pharmaceutical industry raised some questions from the public about the, this interestedness and ob objectivity of his research, Zhong is still largely admired and trusted in China. There was little uh, critical discussion about the relation between science and commerce in China, 
which might not be surprising as science has long been promoted for its utility in China. Therefore, it seems that the trust in science is not necessarily tainted by commercial interest in China as it is in the West. So I already see the hand and because of the time limit, um, I could only scratch the surface of what these individual sci scientists and experts cases can demonstrate about the relations between science, politics, commerce and public trust. I hope that these detailed empirical materials can be helpful to understand how scientific credibility is challenged and forged in China during the crisis when individuals navigating between their different roles. I also want to emphasize that public confidence in science and governmental advisors rests largely on the reliability of persons rather than institution and formal process in China. And uh, that's the end of my uh, mini lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ishu Mao, for this wonderful lecture and insight um, into how Chinese individuals um, responded to the COVID-19 pandemic and yeah, also um, how um, this affected public trust. Um, without further ado, we will go straight to our next speaker and I would like to invite um, Scott now to continue with his talk, History in the Making, COVID Calls and the COVID-19 Pandemic. Okay, uh, thank you to the organizers and uh, for this invitation and thank you, Teresa, for the introduction. I also wanna acknowledge my fellow panelists for sharing their work today. It's great to see so many of these wonderful researchers here. I wish I was in Berlin with you and good to see friends there as, as well. Uh, I'm eager to share with you a brief report on an unconventional work in progress. At least it's unconventional for me. Uh, it's not a book or an article, at least not yet. It's a daily podcast project, which has now turned into a, a podcast archive project on the COVID-19 pandemic. And it's called COVID Calls. And I'll explain the, the name in a moment. Uh, COVID Calls started on March 16th, uh, 2020. It started um, the week that Drexel University, my where I was teaching at that time had closed. And in fact, Drexel closed on Friday and over that weekend, I decided that I would um, do what I would normally do, and in fact was already doing, which is to start calling around experts, particularly uh, practitioners, emergency managers, people in public health, what we've come to call essential workers over this uh, pandemic period, call around and just um, ask how they were doing, find out what they were working on, particularly what kinds of social science questions were arising um, in their work. And given that we were all moving on to Zoom or those of us who had the privilege to do so, um, I decided I would actually make those calls public for the first time. And that's a lot of how my historical methodology has worked in disaster research, which is um, quite often to start with contemporary disaster and hazard issues, talk to practitioners, and then work backwards to try to understand the sort of uh, trail of slow disaster that leads us to where we find ourselves now. So that was my idea. I started with it um, in a kind of a Zoom webinar platform. And after two weeks, I took it up into social media and just did it as a daily broadcast. And so it's available now um, most every day. I do them at 5.30 p.m. Eastern time, although I've started to do some on Korea time where I am now. Uh, and um, it's available on Twitter and YouTube. Those are the two most reliable platforms. I even I put it up on Twitch in case any uh, video gamers wanted to learn about social science aspects uh, of COVID-19. I've had a pretty low audience on Twitch, uh, frankly, but I've put it up in various platforms just to see who was interested in this, in this kind of discussion. It's a one hour discussion, usually with one guest, although sometimes more, um, and it usually has a, a central theme I always start with um, some statistics, some death statistics, mortality statistics, and then I usually read an obituary, and then I introduce the guests and, and move into the into the conversation. And I did number two hundred, and I had to check the number. I did number two hundred seventy-seven this morning, um, talking with journalists Michelle Weldon and Marianne Renault. We talked today about actually vaccination culture in the United States, which is a country that. Um, had vaccine shortages six weeks ago and now has in most of the country a vaccine glut. And so we talked about some of the strange cultural um, 
the uncanny nature of people having to go to odd places, um, not usually sites of therapy uh, to receive vaccination. So that's what I was doing this morning. Um, just a couple of background notes, as I mentioned, it is um, this kind of work is often the way I try to do uh, history of disaster work, which is to connect contemporary issues to um, historical antecedents. It's also COVID calls grows out of my conviction that there are not strong enough relationships um, among disaster researchers across different disciplines. And there are definitely not strong enough relationships among disaster researchers and journalists. And journalists, there are very few journalists in uh, the United States, I can speak about confidently, and I think most countries in Europe don't have um, journalists who are on the disaster beat. Now, more and more major newspapers might have climate journalists, um, but journalists who might specialize in this, I've learned in talking to lots of journalists this year, in some newspapers and some news organizations, a lot of journalists had to become public health experts really fast. And so they rely on the researchers that they already have published or the research relationships, the relationships that journalists already have with researchers. And so part of COVID calls was an attempt to try to have conversations that brought social science researchers of disaster who often um, I will confess, we often work in very esoteric areas. We often use highly specialized lingo. We're often afraid to um, go on the record uh, because we work in patient slow way with peer review. And so we like to make sure everything is right before we say anything, which I found is uh, highly irritating to journalists who are working on deadline and they'll take care of their own fact checking, but they wanna hear from researchers. They wanna know um, what the current state of thinking about vaccine hesitancy might be, for example. And so COVID calls was intended, is intended still to be a, a format where journalists and researchers can find each other and forge these relationships. Um, it's evolved from there, like I said, from a live webinar program to an interview program. And I did not initially think of it as an archive that would go beyond three months. At the hundredth episode in the summer of last year, I imagined would be the last episode, but I'm sure as all of you have experienced, um, this pandemic is a disaster in many parts, or if you'll excuse a theatrical metaphor, it's a, it's a disaster in many acts. And every time I've considered stopping doing COVID calls, um, some new uh, act has unfolded. And so I've stopped putting end dates on it. And I think of it now as both a simultaneous sort of daily discussion in the context of what I was just um, explaining to you, but also as an archive in the making, um, which I have no experience in whatsoever. Uh, I have no formal archival training. I have no library science training. I've relied a lot on experts in those areas to think through some of the issues. But in many ways, I've also been following um, my intuitions here and following the lead of social scientists who I know are discovering new problems in the moment and then looking at those problems um, through the, you know, putting those in relief of the background of the research that many of them have devoted their entire careers to. So with that, I'm just gonna share um, a few main points that it's, it's hard for me to generalize about the experience because I mean, even just in the last four or five sessions, I've talked about, um, I've talked with a, an artist in the Zuni Pueblo in New Mexico who makes public health art. Today, as I mentioned, I talked with two, um, two journalists. Tomorrow morning, I'm gonna be talking with four epidemiologists about saliva tests. Uh, as a therapeutic, or as a testing intervention. And then the next session will be about long COVID with a long COVID activist organization. So sometimes my brain is pretty scrambled. Um, the sessions, I try to follow thematically where I can, but in a lot of times I schedule them uh, whenever people are available. And so let me draw out a few themes though, uh, very briefly for you. And I think these themes will not be surprising to you. They might feel quite intuitive, but I think they're the ones that I see emerging, no matter what I think we're gonna talk about with whatever guests I have on, these seem to be the themes that are emerging. First of all, disasters are not events, they're processes. And they are episodes of collective and individual sense-making happening simultaneously. Something about the COVID-19 pandemic it's in a unique time scale from the perspective of social science disaster research. Most social science disaster research historically has taken an event scale focus. That is to say, and, and that wouldn't be surprising to you as forged in the 
days of the Cold War in which countries like the United States and the UK and the Soviet Union were funding research to understand how society would hold up in the aftermath of nuclear attack event. They had pre-decided, by the way, that society would fall apart. So there's a lot of money spent on social science. They found some very interesting things. Um, but the event drove the analysis in the last 10 years. Of course, uh, climate change and the Anthropocene concepts have created a space for research in what I call slow disaster research, disasters that are creeping out over long periods of time um, and that are having impacts that are often imperceptible day by day, event by event, but are known in a more in a longer fullness of time that takes special attention to data analytics, instrumentation, and various things that we think of as um, aspects of climate change understanding. It's a unique time scale for researchers, not slow and not fast, and particularly with the simultaneity. So, so many researchers I've talked to are almost stunned by the amount of data that's being produced. I mean, the idea that you could find out simultaneously how people in every continent of the planet are reacting to a disaster is an unknown phenomena for modern social science, or for any social science for that matter. Um, and then quite frequently in COVID calls, the researchers I've talked to will comment, they say, it's a little weird for me to be living through this myself. I often think of myself as sort of objectively distant from disaster, but I'm also processing my own life experience in this moment. And so there is that sort of scalers, time scalar issues and geographical scalar issues playing out, people trying to make sense of the disaster as a global phenomenon, which plays out in the extremely local, extremely personal way. Um, looking for reference points and metaphors, I was really fascinated to talk to Robert J. Lifton, who you may know Lifton's work. He's a psychologist who was involved in the anti-nuclear movement, the Physicians for Social Responsibilities, worked on climate change a lot in the last decade. And talking with Lifton was really eye-opening for me because he talked about the ways that nuclear exposure, radiation exposure, and COVID may be quite similar. The exposures are often immaterial. Um, the effects for many people of those, like looking at long COVID or people who are exposed to radiation um, uh, over time, either downwinders or, or in Japan or in other places, um, the effects might be known over long periods of time or never, but the trauma is real as people wonder what the effects might be. So drawing out those kinds of connections um, have been interesting and have surfaced at a number of different points. Um, Lifton was particularly eloquent there. Disasters are also multiple and compound. So at various different moments throughout the pandemic, I've talked with experts who are wildfire experts or hurricane experts. How will we deal with a pandemic in the middle of, or a wildfire in the middle of a pandemic or a hurricane in the middle of a pandemic? It's provided a unique um, and I think quite terrifying experience for a lot of practitioners who spend their lives talking about being prepared for what they call all hazards. But one example from the United States, Every emergency operations center in the United States has been activated throughout the pandemic. That's never been seen before. So this idea that practitioners are finding that the disaster is the pandemic, but in fact, it's many disasters nested together, which are contingent and connected to one another. There's a lot more I could say about the sort of sense-making aspect. I'll, I'll move on from there, except to point out that also in the midst of the pandemic, external, what would often be treated by researchers as sort of unrelated or external events have made the pandemic sort of unrecognizable as singularly a public health event. For example, the murder of George Floyd in the United States or the war in Gaza that's happening right now. We know that the, the conditions of the pandemic have changed the experience of those other types of disasters, but how exactly are they interacting? What are the preconditions that made the pandemic worse in some places, which might then making these compounded disasters even worse, or surprisingly, in some cases, maybe not as bad as you might expect. A second theme, which I'm just going to touch on briefly, is that disasters reveal and they also cause inequality. I mentioned Mallory Kwetaki, the artist uh, in the Zuni Pueblo. And Teresa, just to clarify, I can take two or three more minutes at this point. Is that right? Okay, good. Um, so in the Zuni Pueblo, of course, a, an inheritance of mistrust in um, the United States public health officials. Um, maybe mistrust is too strong, but extra scrutiny. She's an artist who has actually taken um, posters, public health posters from the Centers for Disease Control in the United States. I encourage you to look at of her, of her art, Q-U-E, 
T-A-W-K-I. Um, and she's translated those posters um, using symbolism, color, artwork, and themes that would be resonant within the indigenous tribes that she's worked with there. So it's just one small example of how a translation process has been necessary um, to deal with legacies of inequality and to also react in a very real way to the fact that this pandemic has produced new inequalities, not only in the United States, although that has, the United States case has been acute. Um, let me just skip to a last point here. Um, I would just say, if you, if you wanna hear what experts have to say on just about any topic in the pandemic, I would encourage you to look at the, at the archive of COVID calls. The full archive will be up in about a month. So every episode will be available in audio, video, and transcript. And I'm also inviting every one of the participants um, and please feel free to suggest yourself as a future guest. Um, I'm inviting each participant to also write about um, what it was like for them at the time that they were interviewed. So there'd be a sort of extra layer of data around um, their initial interview. But the other thing I'll just leave you with is that it's, 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 it's truly, it's evident to me and in many discussions I've had that disasters are political struggles, struggles over memory. But we usually think about that in some sort of moment when a disaster is over. And there's a, a push, usually through some activism from victim families to raise a marker of some sort, open a museum of some sort. This is a disaster in which the politics of memory are playing out literally in real time. And I'll just leave you with this example. In the United States, a woman named Kristen Urquiza's father died of COVID. He was a, a Republican, a Trump supporter. She's not, um, but they're a family. Um, he got COVID when Trump said it was okay to take off his mask last spring. And she wrote what has come to be called an honest obituary in which she called out the Trump administration as sharing culpability for her father's death. She went from this simple act, writing an obituary, to speaking at the Democratic National Convention. And she's gone from there to forming an activist organization called Marked by COVID. I've had her on the program several times. And in fact, she's going to be a guest host something I'm moving to from now to the end of the year is having more and more guest voices. So there's less Knowles and more other perspectives in COVID calls. But she's an example of someone who we might have looked at as historians and said, well, this is a victim with a particular struggle and she'll, she'll begin to do her activism as the disaster ends. But there's no clear ending point in sight. So she didn't wait. And I think you can see that with the long COVID movement, um, with various different movements for transparency and data, data analytics. And there are a lot of spaces for activism in the pandemic, and they are overlapping with what we've traditionally segregated out as memorial efforts. So I'll, I'll leave it there, except to say, as I'm in the second year of COVID calls, um, the research portal is going to go live in about a month. I hope you'll feel free to use it, make suggestions. I'm opening to more artistic and scholarly creativity to engage with the calls. I'm hoping some of them will become animated. Some of them might be turned into um, graphic novel form. I'm broadening the range of hosts, and uh, this will stand to reason because I'm based in South Korea now. Um, I'm trying to broaden the geographic scope of the project as well. So I'm, I could talk uh, for apparently at least 277 hours about COVID calls. At least that's what I've done so far in the last 15 months, but I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you so much, Scott. Um, that was really inspiring and thought-provoking. Thank you for these uh, valuable insights into your project. And we are all very curious to see what is coming in the next month um, in co on COVID calls. And um, yeah, I would like to next invite Laura Spinney for her micro lecture, Pandemics Past and Present. Thank you very much, Teresa. Um, and I think and hope uh, that uh, what I'm going to say will complement what the two others have said so eloquently. Um, I thought about the title, Public Communication and Trust in Science, and I would like to discuss three, um, I think, interlocking themes, making a few comments about each. They are trust, information, and memory. Um, so first of all, trust. Um, I think that pandemics are profoundly political phenomena. And it's therefore really difficult to disentangle trust in science from trust in um, political institutions in a pandemic context. And maybe we should even think about outside the pandemic context too as well, about whether they can be disentangled. And I think the most blatant um, illustration of that is, uh, is how they're named. 
Uh, I probably don't need to tell this audience about the fact that um, the Spanish flu wasn't particularly Spanish, wasn't anything particularly Spanish about its origins. Um, it was a great historical injustice. Um, uh, I can explain why if necessary, but basically um, it suited the warring nations to blame uh, uh, somebody else in neutral country for the disaster at the time, um, at least in the beginning, and then the name stuck. And, you know, uh, this time around, uh, we thought we'd done quite well. Uh, people followed the WHO guidelines and gave the disease uh, an apparently neutral name, um, COVID, for coronavirus disease uh, 2019. Um, we were doing so well until the variants came along. <laughs> uh, and then it all fell, fell apart and we started pointing fingers and, um, and stigmatizing different parts of the world. Um, and uh, and that's even before you get to the conspiracy theories, uh, my, my favorite of which is... Uh, is um, the that COVID stood for certification of vaccination identification by AI, uh, which Reuters myth busted uh, this time roughly last year. AI being the first and ninth letters of the alphabet, <laughs> so that's what nineteen was supposed to stand for. And I think this um, this kind of politicization is just diffuses the whole the whole way that we understand and and, and respond to the pandemic. Uh, it's reflected in the sort of nationalistic, at best regionalistic way that we interpret it, talk about it, um, talk about the impacts and responses. Maybe the, 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 the main you can see that most clearly in now is, is vaccination, not just the whole issue about vaccine equity, um, but also the sort of rather uh, almost jingoistic reporting of the vaccine race and the way that reporters in different countries got behind their local team, even though all the teams were pretty much... Uh, 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 universally international collaborations. Um, and then the narrative also about, you know, there, there being two pandemics, which I think is quite interesting. This time last year, we were talking about, are there two pandemics, a rich world pandemic, and, and the rest have somehow uh, got off rather lightly. Now the tables have turned, we're talking about, are there two pandemics? <laughs> it's the other way around. Somehow the rich world seems to be coming out of it and the, and the and the poorer world seems to be having a terrible time. But anyway, we've always seen it as, we've always had this this question of whether there are two pandemics. Um, and maybe that speaks actually to, to Scott's point about our difficulty of, in, in kind of conceptualizing the sort of temporal and spatial um, structure of a global phenomenon. And because we have this very political um, politicized uh, view, perception of the pandemic. I think um, that fuels another discussion about what kind of political uh, regime has done better or worse in this pandemic. And that's often pitched as democracy versus autocracy. And that started long before this pandemic. Alfred Crosby and his uh, rightly famous account of the, of the 1918 pandemic in America, which he wrote in the 1970s, asked, um, uh, or suggested that democracies, democracy was unhelpful in a pandemic. And that's a theme actually that I picked up in my book too. Um, and I think that this time around, you've seen that again. Uh, it's also been fueled by the context into which COVID erupted, uh, which is um, a US-China uh, trade war. So it's kind of easy to see, uh, you know, democracy on one hand, autocracy on the other. Uh, and, and the WHO, for example, is an arena where <laughs> that, um, uh, that battle was being fought out vicariously. But to date, as far as I can see, there's, there's no clear cut answer to which, which of those has done better. Um, we've got democracies that did well, like Australia, or done well so far, like Australia and New Zealand, while others, the US, UK, Switzerland, for example, Canada, at least until vaccines came along, weren't doing so well. Um, China and Vietnam have generally perceived to have done well. Cambodia and Venezuela badly. They're all autocracies. So nevertheless, I think that the, the, the classical argument that the strength of autocracies in a pandemic is, is the centralization of decision making, while that of dem democracies is transparent, transparency, freedom of flow of information, probably still holds. And, and so what might be more useful is to look at the sort of strengths and weaknesses of each and see, um, uh, you know, how, how each can do better. Uh, and in defense of Alfred Crosby and myself, democracies weren't so transparent in 1918. <laughs> While the war was still being fought, uh, there was uh, outright censorship in many countries. And, and even after that, it was, a, it was a fairly paternalistic attitude that the media had to the general public. And that brings me to my second point, which is um, information. So as I said, the classic argument in favor of democracies in a pandemic context is transparency. 
Um, and I think that the countries that have done best so far um, seem to be those that have made the best use of information um, and so uh, avoided the need to resort to um, emergency central powers, for example, and, and sacrifice um, democracy. Um, those are the countries, uh, those countries, for example, that have done effective contact tracing. Uh, um, and we, we know now that there's a, it's not the contact tracing is not the only thing that goes towards a good containment of COVID, but it is, there is a robust um, correlation with, for example, case fatality rate. Um, and so the countries that have done good contact tracing and that have also fought misinformation, um, for, for example, Taiwan and uh, South Korea. Um, I think the key point about those countries was that um, they seem to have been ready uh, in this sense before this pandemic erupted. Um, Taiwan, for example, learned from uh, the SARS epidemic of 2003, South Korea from um, MERS in, in 2015, both had uh, legal frameworks in place before COVID erupted. Um, which allowed them to uh, make best use of information in the context that I've already described. Um, and they have uh, they have admitted to a kind of loss of privacy that the loss of privacy was going to be necessary, but within constitute within a constitutional framework with appropriate checks and balances um, and with importantly a public approval. Uh, the um, in Taiwan surveys have shown that uh, um, public approval of the government's uh, COVID response have been extremely high, whereas they were low in general of the government before the pandemic. Um, so I think uh, that what, what this teaches us, which wasn't necessarily um, particularly obvious before COVID, was that um, the contact tracing debacle in some countries, in some advanced democracies, um, and the kind of concomitant uh, infodemic that, um, that we discussed earlier, uh, wasn't inevitable um, by any means, and that um, there's a need to, uh, when talking about information, distinguish between anti-democratic um, powers and anti-liberal uh, powers. And this feeds into the debate that was going on, obviously, before um, the pandemic about whether and how to regulate um, social media um, and whether um, we need to readjust the balance so that uh, state surveillance and uh, surveillance capitalism, as Shoshana Zuboff has called it, um, can somehow be used to hold each other in check in a way that is more, um, more in the interest of the citizen user and would help us in a future, future situ situation like this. Um, and the last point uh, I wanted to uh, discuss, um, which Scott also discussed, was uh, memory. Because um, I think what's fascinating about the Taiwanese and South Korean examples is that um, they wouldn't, that their solutions, which as I said, were in place before COVID would not have been possible without collective memory, without having learnt from past experiences of epidemics and pandemics, SARS in the case of Taiwan, MERS in the case of South Korea. And, and what's interesting about that is that it's, it's both the governments and people who learned. Um, governments learned that they needed, uh, you know, this new legal framework that would enable them to manage things. And people understood the need to comply and the need also to take to take part in that process, to be part of that, what Audrey Tang, the Taiwanese uh, digital minister, calls uh, digital democracy. Um, so obviously that was something uh, that was lacking in many countries in, um, in the, uh, the so-called West, in Western Europe and North America, for example. Um, and I think, uh, you know, that question of memory, public health experts uh, often despair that we, we go through this cycle. Uh, they talk classically about the cycle of panic and complacency, that we panic when a new um, epidemic or pandemic erupts, and then we forget about it as soon as it's passed, and uh, we, we fail to take the measures um, that are necessary to prepare us better for the next one. Um, and I think we, we do forget um, um, uh, pandemics more easily than other um, major disasters that perhaps cause the same scale of death, uh, for example, wars. Um, I think there are many reasons for that. It's not particularly clear why that is, but it's definitely multifactorial. Um, one, one theory is that um, if the comparison is with wars, for example, that we bounce back more quickly from, from pandemics, that 
um, both destroy people, but only wars destroy infrastructure. So uh, the recovery is faster from the pandemic. Um, but maybe also because uh, the really big pandemics seem to recur at a horizon beyond um, beyond the human lifespan. So when the new one comes along, there's no one still alive and certainly no institutions that retain um, a memory of the last one. Um, and hence, we've taken measures to sort of make up for that since the beginning of this century, for example, um, various uh, governments and institutions have organized simulations, pandemic simulations, or, or they're sometimes called pandemic tabletop exercises, um, to rehearse with a bunch of stakeholders, government people, public health experts, sometimes business leaders, security experts around a table, um, to rehearse the response to a pandemic, learn where the weak points are, how to make that response stronger and better. Um, and, uh, you know, a number of those have happened in the last 20 or so years. And uh, some lessons were learned from, I think they were valuable. What, what's interesting about them is that they've led to this new debate about what lessons we should take from history, which are the important lessons, uh, and can history actually lead us astray? So, you know, there's been a narrative, for example, that, that governments were too focused on flu. Uh, when this pandemic erupted and they, they responded to it in the way they might have done to flu, which after all has caused more pandemics than other, any other disease in history. Um, and that the sort of resignation at the beginning that this was not something that could be contained, that no COVID was not was an impossible dream, was because they were thinking of it more as a flu disease and, and not with the, the, the profile and the various characteristics that we now um, know that COVID has. Um, and then also I've been interested, really interested this year about the kind of knee-jerk reaction to compare. There is, there is this instinct to want to compare it to history, historical examples, which is obvious and understandable. But why, why the 1918 flu? Everyone immediately reaches for the 1918 flu. There's been very little discussion of, for example, the 1957 Asian flu pandemic, so-called Asian flu, or the 1968 so-called Hong Kong flu pandemic, which arguably were better references uh, um, in terms of, uh, well, in, in many ways, really, uh, including their scale. Um, and then, um, on, on the issue of forgettability, there's an interesting debate going on about whether this particular pandemic might actually buck the trend of forgettability. Um, Astrid Earle at the University of Frankfurt um, has suggested that it could, that it could actually be the first major pandemic to be remembered because it's the first major pandemic um, to have occurred after the internet revolution when um, anybody who anybody with access to the internet anywhere in the world, if they were so inclined, could from the beginning follow uh, infection rates and death rates almost in real time. So we always had a sense of, uh, uh, as soon as, as the data showed it at least, that this was a global phenomenon, that we were all living through it. Um, and obviously that information is still there as being conserved and will form the basis of some kind of memory. I think it will be a really interesting experiment. Will that, will that convert into a better memory? For this, uh, for this pandemic than of other historical pandemics? And will that in turn shape our ability to think about and prepare for future ones? Or is there something inherent to pandemics, something about them that makes them forgettable that has nothing to do with the archiving of inf information about them? Um, at any rate, and this is uh, the point I think I'll end on, uh, I, I think the good news is that uh, the time using South Korean examples I mentioned earlier um, give us hope that at least those who have lived through, those of us who have lived through COVID will learn from it and will prepare better next time, even if we are not the ones who will benefit from those preparations uh, necessarily. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Laura, for um, these very interesting thoughts on the pandemic as a political phenomena and also um, on the role of memory and the role of history. So um, thanks also again to all of the three speakers for um, setting the stage for the discussion. Um, we will now directly move um, into the panel discussion. And so I invite all the panelists to unmute themselves now. And um, for the next 15 minutes, you have time to react to each other's micro lectures and feel also free to ask one another questions. Meanwhile, everybody else um, is invited to write up questions in the Etherpad for the Q&A session and the link is in the chat box. Can I, 
start by asking Yishu a question then. Of course. <laughs> Hi, Yishu. I was really interested by what you said about, I, I can't remember which one of the three figures you described, um, but that uh, he um, hit one of his messages was that you could be loyal to the Communist Party and to uh, the values of science at the same time. And I wondered how that was received. Do people accept that? Thank you for the question, Laura. Um, judging by how popular he was among um, the general public, and you know, like he was even called the dead Zhang, just because he is really representing this figure that offers very offers hints of light in such darkness during the. Um, early days of the, the outbreak. I would say he, and my assessment is that he, he has been quite successful in um, presenting that it is possible to be adherent to the values of the CCP and science. Um, but yeah, it's very, I mean, it, that I, I don't really have um, enough time and space to really dig deeper into exactly how he did it. Um, and uh, I also, you know, by presenting the case of Gao Fu, uh, kind of just pose the two figures. Um, you know, I'm trying to show that um, it's not always possible. There's a lot of um, um, contingency in it, and there's a lot about the personal um, stories and narratives and how they present their, yeah, different roles and identities. Mm, yeah. Yishu, do you, do you mind if I ask you another question? Or is that okay? I just want to follow up. Um, it, you know, something actually that both of you were talking about that I think is, is really fascinating to me is that um, um, in the context of disaster, sort of social science research on um, misinformation or conspiracy has often been kind of peripheral, treated separately, really. And yet, as you described it, Yushu, this was an issue that um, was important throughout the early stages of the pandemic in China. Can you say a little bit about what you see? I mean, is that, a, is that now a lively area for research in China? How, um, did the sort of sense that the information sphere could be quickly corrupted? How was that addressed in either in, in expert discourse or in more public discourse? Um, that's a actually really, really good question. Um, but how could you elaborate a bit more like when you mean that this in, information sphere is disrupted, corrupted, um, you know, I immediately think about two ways that it could be corrupted. One way is that when the information is suppressed by the um, government and by politi for political means, and the other way that it can be corrupted is, you know, there's just misinformation. There's what is called rumors in China. There are just mm -hmm. uh, in inaccurate information about how to protect yourself, there's even like in the beginning, say you can just drink hard liquor and that would help protect you against the virus, right? So there's these two uh, ways I can imagine. And which one do you mean? Or um, is or did you mean that include all these possibilities? I'm interested in both, although, uh, you know, misinformation is, like you said, I think maybe we see that in a lot of disasters, a lot of previous pandemics, but this idea of, of weaponizing misinformation to achieve political aims. Um, and, and that somehow you can't understand the pandemic response unless you understand that the government has to react to that. That to me is a relatively new phenomenon. And I'm wondering sort of your take on that in the Chinese perspective. Um, yeah, I definitely also observed this especially, you know, after that the, after situation was brought under control within China, then the narrative 
can be just within China could be brought up and say, look, we've done this, we've been successful. And, you know, um, Europe, America, they have been criticizing us. They've been um, calling that it's Asian virus and now it's it's their turn, right? And especially now within China, there's a lot of um, kind of this, um, not forced, but um, rather, packaged and shaped narratives that might not be true um, against the West. And um, for that, actually, I haven't, I, there are some criticism, there are some debates about this, but um, it's not as lively as in the beginning of the pandemic mm. um, regarding Chinese domestic infosphere. Um, yeah, but like, for example, one example I'm thinking now is um, now about vaccines. A um, couple of days ago, the news was widely spread in China by many media outlets, especially on social media, because there's no gatekeeper. You can just publish uh, false information very fast, and then one media outlet copy another one. So the news was that um, Chinese produced vaccines were accepted by the um, European uh, Drug Med Administration. Mm -hmm. And they did a survey within Europe, over 80% of people are happy to, to, uh, to, to accept the Chinese vaccine. And this just, you know, spread very fast and gained a lot of um, very proud reception. Um, but then, you know, one media outlet came out and said, wait, this is not true. Uh, it's still under review. It didn't happen. But, you know, like the speed of this spread was so fast that even though there's a later clarification, the effect has, um, it's already on the ground. It's already made. Um, and there's not much follow-up debates on the general impact. Um, yeah. I have a question for Scott, if possible. Um, I was really interested by what you said about some of the journalists that you've spoken to who um, have had to learn public health really fast. I mean, my my perception of it is that the reporting of the pandemic, at least you know from where I stand, has been mainly led by people who are already scientific or medical or health correspondence but it is it is really interesting because of course it is a whole of society phenomenon everybody's Im implicated and affected and there has had to be those sort of conversations about you know between journalists about about you know the specialties and, and who whose domain and you know how to part it, how to share out the the reporting and and and, and get things right um, so I wondered how the journalists you'd spoken to were your impression of that, how that got parceled out? Because, you know, I think one fear amongst science and medical journalists, at least in, in, in previous crises, perhaps, is that they're going to be pushed aside and the kind of <laughs> the main, you know, the political reporters will take over when actually they know nothing about the subject fundamentally. Yeah, I, I, that's a really interesting question because um, I, I agree with the with you in that, you know, I've talked with like Ed Yong, um, who wrote tremendous stories last year in the Atlantic. And, you know, Ed's published books and history of genomics and he's, you know, he's a science writer. So, so in that sense, it wasn't a pivot. And, and you can see probably in the depth of his source relationships that how quickly he was able to give, you know, really in-depth reporting to what was happening in which were quite mysterious for a lot of Americans, what's happening inside of our Health and Human Services Agency, for example, or CDC. Um, so I think that's right. And I think for major news organizations like the New York Times or the Washington Post, that's, that's probably true. But there've been a couple of other sort of communities of journalists that um, I rely a lot on in my disaster historical work that was very eager to speak to. One of course is, is more local journalists and mm -hmm. You know, if you're talking to journalists, I'll give you an example in um, East Texas, which is a place that was hit by a major hurricane in 2017. 
and has the highest cancer rates, uh, second highest cancer rates from petrochemical exposures um, in the United States. Then to layer the pandemic on top, I was really interested to hear from them how the pandemic was gonna affect these communities that were already, have been suffering from disasters over time. And everybody in the newsroom suddenly had to, like I said, sort of learn you know, these, how to cover a pandemic, how to ask public health questions of public officials, where the public health data were stored, who has the right, which judge decides what people died of, if there's a contest. I mean, these kinds of really just sort of factual questions, they had to get up to speed on, on that. But that's a, that's a mate, this is a problem in the United States, particularly that's a major population center with one newspaper. So talking to journalists in these sort of um, secondary or tertiary news markets was, was um, important. And then the other was to, like the two journalists I talked to today, one of them particularly, um, are freelancers who might be working on any number of topics and then found that there was an insatiable desire for COVID reporting. So it's feast or famine in that world. And they all had to retailer themselves, at least the ones I talked to very quickly um, as public health reporters. And I don't mean to criticize them for that. You know, I, I think that, mm. but what I saw in that was that they may not have had the ability to have those longstanding relationships with researchers. Um, that may be somebody who's already covering um, you know, science on the science desk in the New York Times or the Washington Post uh, might have had. And um, so I think it talks, it says something about the splintering of the, the consolidation of the media market, particularly in the United States, mm. but still that sort of yawning need for local coverage and for really strong investigative reporting and um, you know reporters who are out there doing um, individual pieces that they can research for a period of time. Now, a couple of organizations like ProPublica in the United States or Vox, but I think particularly ProPublica has been quite good at trying to fill that gap with just funds to allow some of these um, journalists to you know find these stories um, and get them out there. I, get, I mean, one one of the reasons this is always on my mind as a historian is that when I try to make sense of what happened in Chicago in 1871 or what happened in Philadelphia in the middle of the 1918 flu, is I'm relying on a lot of newspaper reporting from that time. So I always have it in my mind. I'm like, well, what's the news trail going to be like even 10 years out from this pandemic? How in depth will it be? And to what extent is the research that's available being amplified through the media? I think it's been hit and miss. Well, I think it's really interesting what your, your suggestion that, that, that there should be a disaster beat, um, because it reminds me of a conversation I had with some uh, British politicians on a podcast where they were talking about the need for a ministry of emergencies. <laughs> that was, I, I mean, we had a long discussion about how it would work, how it would, you know, respond to yeah. different varieties and disasters, and you can drill down to the details. But I wondered if these ideas reflected some kind of, you know, I mean, they obviously do reflect a mood in society that, you know, uh, we're on the verge of some kind of, you know, things are not good and things are going to get worse and, uh, you know, disasters are going to become more common. Yeah, I mean, you know, the minister Ministry of Emergencies does sound a little Orwellian, doesn't it? And I mean, there's a, dis, a sort of a discourse in the United States right now about creating a national um, disaster investigation board, like a freestanding disaster board that would be governmental. But you can imagine that then every news organization would have to have somebody who covers it if it's a part of government. Mm. Um, but it's, I just will close with saying this, something you pointed to in your comment. By the time the summer came, you will notice more and more political reporters in the United States leading pandemic coverage because the pandemic from basically July through November in the United States was primarily reported as a political story. And so that, I think that that just is, is about how many eyeballs are gonna be on screens and how many clicks you're gonna get. And I, and I worry about that because I think that, and if you had political journalists tell me this, they're like, wow, I really was covering the campaign and now they wanted me to know about the pandemic plan for the Biden administration, Biden campaign. And I had to figure out what that was. So yeah, disaster beat. I'd love to see it. Um, I don't know what kind of advertising you're going to sell with that, but we should try. <laughs> Bunkers. <laughs> Do I have time to ask a, a question of Laura before we open up, Teresa? Just real quick yes. question. Of course. Um, I, Laura, I just, I mean, I just sort of want to know, first of all, I'm a huge fan of your work. And I wanted, I just want to know, like, how many calls did you field about the 1918? pandemic because <laughs> because I was getting calls and I'm not a 
was not a pandemic expert. And I remember one call, a reporter said, what about 1918? And I actually said, I said, well, I think maybe 1968 is a more interesting one to think about. Yeah. And she said, yeah, but what about 1918? <laughs> and I said, maybe you should talk to somebody who's written. Maybe that journalist talk, called you, I don't know. But they were, I, I mean, the I mean, angles on 1918, it, you must have been asked about every aspect of it. Yeah, I mean, it started last February and it hasn't stopped since. And what I think is really interesting is that, um, is I think I, I might have mentioned this, is, is the way the narrative has slightly shifted over that time from saying, why haven't we learned the his lessons of history to maybe history isn't always that helpful. And it depends, you know, what, what, what lessons should we be taking and which are unhelpful. And in the UK, just a, I mean, a quick concrete example of that was um, there was this uh, uh, 2016 government organized simulation one of the simulations i talked about called operation cygnus about something called swan flu hypothetical pandemic and um uh first of all they didn't the, the, the report wasn't published it took three years for anyone to acknowledge that um uh, you know any lessons needed to be learned um and then uh, in a in a, um, an inquiry last december so in the thick of covid um the people who were in charge uh, at that time did say and it's on the record that you know maybe we took maybe we were too focused on flu when uh, COVID came along and that shaped our attitude from the start and this particularly this thinking that we couldn't contain it um, so I think you know that is really interesting debate um, but it does seem to me to, that we did focus far too strongly on 1918 the so-called forgotten pandemic can we even still call it that <laughs> Okay, um, then uh, with this, we will end um, today's um, colloquium and um, sorry. Um, and I would like to thank, first of all, um, all our panelists, Ishu Mao, Scott Gabriel Knowles, and Laura Spinney for their engaging and informative presentations and also the discussions from, um, yeah, which I um, am sure we will on, we have all learned a lot. And um, I just tried um, to share um, my screen and here now I succeed, <laughs> um, where you can see the link um, for more about this year's series, including speaker bios, abstracts, and videos of past events. And um, yeah, I would also like um, to thank the audience for joining us um, for this colloquium today, and also on behalf of the organizers for joining the colloquium the whole academic year. We have really in valued everyone's attention and uh, support, and we hope that you enjoyed also the new dig digital format of the Institute's colloquium. The next colloquium will take place on June 15, and I am passing the privilege of chairing the colloquium to my co colleague Pablo Ruiz de Olano for a talk that was rescheduled due to the pandemic from last year's series, History of Science, right here, right now. And um, in this talk, Katja Krause will explore the role of experience in the pre-modern sciences of soul and body. So make sure to not miss um, the colloquium um, next time. And um, meanwhile, we will all keep an eye on how public communication and trust in science develops in the ongoing pandemic. Thanks a lot, everyone.